What's up, Wildcat Nation? Welcome back to Oil and Gas Service Podcast. We've got a buddy Cole with, I don't know, I'm going to say pipe search, but it's also sealer alloys, right? It is pipe search and corrosion resistant alloys, which uh, CRA is okay. what we're known in the market for. So we, I think somebody on your team had reached out a while back and was just like, hey, do you know, take out what we're doing. It's actually pretty cool. Um, I'm going to butcher pitch again. So how about you just go ahead and tell us kind of high level what you guys do? Okay. Uh, we are in the pipe business, oil country tubular goods. Uh, we sell predominantly high alloy OCTG, and uh, which means kind of 13 chromes, uh, duplex, super duplex, and nickel-based alloys. Uh, CRA is a manufacturer of these products. We specialize just in time manufacturing. We do quick deliveries and, and things such as uh, non-standard sizes, small quantities, things that are kind of disruptive to typical uh, manufacturers. And then we have a trading side of our business. And the trading side of our business is really what kind of led to the evolution of pipe search. And so pipe search, we we're essentially trying to bring technology to a, a space that has been doing things the same way for literally a hundred years in, in a lot of areas. Yeah. So tell us what OCTG means. Um, it's an acronym, obviously. I think you said it's oil country tubular goods. But what is like what is that? Like what does that actually mean? Every pipe company talks about it, but what is yeah. it? Yeah. So you're you're right. OCTG, oil country tubular goods. It is your tubing, it's your casing, uh, it's your material for liners. It is uh, it's what goes down hole, uh, both to kind of hold the integrity of the well and you produce through. So mm-hmm. uh, the tubing side, you hear people say uh, production tubing, uh, you have casing as well. Yeah. So all your pipe that's going down hole is going to fit under this bucket of OCTG. And is that just the standard? It's this, it's a standard term. Uh, mm. It's honestly, yeah, I've always wondered why that is the term. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's, no, kind of, like, it's kind of an odd uh, name, you know, and if you're not familiar with it, people look at you like, you know, they've no, they have no idea what you're talking about. I want to do like, we need to do like some history on like where that name came from because it's a unique name, right? And it's always weird that it's like, Oh, the standardized old yeah, country say, tubular goods. They'll say it's, so. It's not pipe, and I was like, "What is pipe?" It's just a it's a name that fits a bucket of different mm-hmm. types of pipe within it. So it's actually timely that we have you on the show today, because I was just talking about on Twitter a few days back just um, the price increase that we've seen in pipe um, over I don't know last call it six months or so. And a lot of people are saying that it's not just capital discipline keeping rig count at bay, but it's just that, hey, to get casing out is extremely expensive. You know, some people are saying 20 to 30 percent price increase in their pipe. And I've even had another engineer message me and tell me that he saw a 60 percent increase on um, some specific type of string. So I'm sure it's an interesting space right now um, just with overall inflation in the economy and then you look at everything that's just been wrecked in supply chain what is the uh you know what's the value proposition for you guys on the tech side you know we talked about the um the industry doing the same thing the same process for literally a hundred years what was that process tell us about you know how has the pipe business been ran over the last hundred years yeah, great question. Uh, so you have you have your major mills that are producing, melting the steel, producing the pipe. Um, these, uh, you know, like any other mill, you know, they're not just typically in the pipe industry. They're in other automotive, aerospace, Department of Defense. Um, you know, now they're getting pressure to kind of go into green energy and other areas. But um, essentially what's happened over time is that uh, operators will go either to a mill or a representative from a mill, maybe a distributor, and uh, and order something well in advance. And so we typically see, uh, you know, we see times where they order things 16, 18 months out from ap- actual need date. And so, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of forecasting that takes place in that process. And what we've learned in oil and gas is forecasts are rarely accurate. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that change. And, and so, um, you know, we've, we've kind of looked at it and said, you know, forecasting accurately is probably not going to happen, uh, you know, on a sustainable, <clears throat> sustainably over a long term. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there is, we're, this, this industry is more volatile than ever before. And what we see is there's, there's either uh, surplus inventory, idle assets. Uh, so somebody's ordered way too much 
and don't they don't need it anymore. And there's mm -hmm. a whole host of reasons why that's the case. Or they're in a time like now where there's a supply crunch. They need it now. Oil prices is eighty dollars or more. They want to get that pipe in the ground and start producing. And, yeah. And so, you know, it, it is const this industry has constantly been plagued uh, by supply uh, over you know supply overage or supply shortages. And so, yeah. you know, our never whole just perfect harmony or balance. <laughs> hundred percent. Yeah. I, I, when I say hundred percent, there's never hundred percent balance. <laughs> um, but it, you know, looking back. You know, my dad's been in this business since the late seventies. He's like, I've never seen a period where it really is in balance. And so, um, our whole business models really built kind of on that and knowing that there probably will be an imbalance. So you either have supply shortage or you have, uh, you know, have surplus in supply. Yeah. And so, uh, <clears throat> so we, we funnel our model. Out. So pipe search, what fuels the model there, uh, supply side, um, what happens is operators order too much inventory. Um, they order more, it's, you know, from a risk management standpoint, they order more than what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, the opportunity cost of not having material far exceeds, um, you know, far exceeds uh, the, the financial associated with buying too much yeah. until they look down and they have, you know, bukus of material and inventory. And so we've seen it in some places where, they literally have billions of dollars in inventory that's unallocated. Jeez. So essentially, you know, like an operator, like, hey, we need a ton of nine and five eighths casing and we want to drill 30 wells this year. So we're going to order X amount of pipe that we think is sufficient for those wells, plus, you know, an additional 20 to 30% just to make sure that we have plenty of uh, inventory or supply in case we need it. And then they end up not needing it. And so they start building up these kind of stockpiles of pipe and inventory. Correct. So, cool. yeah. So what happens is it, it'll sit there, you know, and, and we see, uh, we had a stat the other day, somebody told me internally that, you know, average pipe that somebody brings to us looking to sell it has been in inventory for almost seven years. Jesus and Christ. So <laughs> there's you can a, drive across Texas and just see yards just absolutely stacked. With pipe. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. So seven years uh, at 20 to 25% all in carrying cost. So by year eight, they've bought it. They bought it the first time they've bought it again after four years and they've bought it for the third time after, after eight years. And then they go to the open market. Traditional paths are taking it to an auction or a liquidation company that gets five to 10% recovery value on the original purchase price. Yeah. So, you know, we, we look at it and say, uh, for, for people who have excess supply, we can provide a path to market for you. Um, we can help you liquidate this material at a, and achieve an increased recovery value. And then for buyers, you know, we are now a, a resource that you can buy for, through where you don't have to wait 16, 18 months uh, for material. Um, we, you know, we've, we deliver stuff in as quickly as a week. So you know, you've got customer A that's sitting on something in Australia. He, He's got a canceled project. Customer B has a similar well type in Europe, uh, but, you know, they want to accelerate the project, uh, but can't find pipe. You know, this is a great resource to pull from the open market. Yeah. So you guys so, are creating a marketplace. <clears throat> My first question is, it, is it only pipe that you guys have manufactured through CR Alloys or is it any pipe manufacturer? Good question. We are, we, so we're, we're kind of pipe agnostic in terms of the supplier, we, we do put it through the same quality control, uh, QA, QC requirements. Um, you know, you kind of mentioned marketplace, you know, it's not as simple as just kind of build it and post it and they will come. There's a lot of quality stuff that, that goes on in between. And that's kind of part of our secret sauce. I mean, you've got this, you've got the technology, uh, but the middle part is, is really connecting, uh, you know, quality control plans just because customer A has, you know, made it to one spec. It doesn't mean, uh, customer B is going to accept that spec. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of stuff that needs to take place uh, between, you know, between the two in that transaction. And, uh, and so, but to answer your question, mill source wise, we'll sell anything. It's just has to meet our minimum quality requirements. And we, we mirror industry standards off that. Yeah. So you're building a peer to peer marketplace, but it's not as simple as, you know, just building a platform and saying, Hey, come list your pipe on here. You know, you could have some you know, Joe Blow listing, you know, 20,000 feet of pipe out in Indonesia that's, you know, junk pipe. So you guys actually have still a QA, QC process for all of the listings that are going up on the market set. 
that fair. Correct. Yeah. How so, do you like how do you QAQC something that's like like you said in the Indonesia? So we've done uh we've done deals in 89 countries now. Dang. Um one of the thing I think the, probably the one of the biggest unintended consequences of this was realizing that our field services team needs to scale, you know. <laughs> so you can scale technology, you can automate, you can connect processes, but you can't replace somebody physically rolling the pipe um and looking at the pipe. You know, we we're automating things in terms of extracting that information and feeding it back quicker than ever before, pulling it in in a normalized fashion and be able to use it. But you do have to have physical boots on the ground. You have to physically move the p material. You may have to physically maintain it. Um, you know, this is not, uh, it's not just technology solution. It's kind of a bricks and mortar uh, plus technology. Yeah. So, I mean, the QA, QC process of pipe is, you know, you're running a drift through it, you're miking it, you're checking threads and um, inspecting them. So, yeah, I mean, there's no way to automate that, right? Like it's, you got to send one or two people on a team to sit there and do the physical work. So how does it, you know, how does that work for you guys? If mm -hmm. say I'm in Indonesia and I've got a ton of pipe, I want to put it up for sale. Do I pay a fee to you guys to put it up? That way it can cover the cost of the QAQC process. How does that like, you know, explain it to me like I'm someone that wants to come put some pipe up for sale. What's the process like? Yeah, great question. We, uh, so the process that we follow is called pipe facts. Um, we, we're in the process of uh, trying to get patent protected. We've got it. Like Carfax? Yeah. It's very similar to Carfax. <laughs> so they must have copied what we were doing. <laughs> um, it's a 200 data point inspection. It's a it's a combination of field field inspection and then also office review of kind of the paperwork and the quality control plans and, and MTRs, mill test reports. Um, it's kind of really looking at the pedigree. And so uh, we anybody who's looking to sell pipe through us, we we we, we do not charge a listing fee. And so what we do is we get paid if we, if we perform. And yeah. so one of our requirements is that everything uh, goes through pipe facts uh, prior to listing. It, it's kind of like, you know, we don't want to all, if, if you compare it to the car industry, we only sell certified pre-owned cars. Mm -hmm. We don't sell anything that is as is, where is. And there so is, they, a, so they go to car or not car facts, they go to pipe facts and then they, they pay for the kind of the QAQC prior. And then you have like that certification of like, Here's the here's the pipe facts. For yeah, they, so they'll come to they'll come to see our or come to pipe search. Okay. Uh, we send, you know, we we kind of agree to what uh, we got another process called pipe stats. It's a, it's a uh, commercial review of what we think that the return value can be as a function of time. And so, uh, you know, we first try to kind of engage and make sure that commercials are lining up with both parties. You know, one reality is in this business, like. Sellers always want to sell it for as much as possible and buyers want to buy it for as cheap as possible, uh, but buyers want the best quality as well. So we kind of have the to- The bid ask spread is always the uh, bane <laughs> of marketplaces is sellers think that their stuff's a lot more valuable than what it is and uh, buyers think that it's not worth as much. <laughs> you nailed it. So we, we use pipe stats to kind of show 20 years of CRA in the business and kind of data that we've aggregated to see what's realistic. And then we use pipe facts to actually prove out uh, where, you know, are there flaws in this material and, or uh, what's the good part too? You know, we, we point out the pros and cons, um, you know, it's not only about what the actual, the condition the pipe is in at that moment in time, but what can we also uh, prove it up to be? So, you know, like a small independent isn't going to have a same quality control plan as say Exxon. And so, you know, part of the pipe facts process is we outline the parameters that, you know, that need to be done to kind of prove it up. So the, to answer the question again, the pipe facts is a for hire process. It's a prerequisite to listing. Um, you know, it's insignificant in terms of cost relative to the bigger picture. Um, you know, but it is, it is something that we do require uh, and use a field services team to kind of execute. When did you guys, um, I mean, tell me about your background. You said your dad was in the pipe business, you know, back since the seventies. How did you, how did you get in the pipe business? You know, just kind of natural attrition to, you know, your dad came from the pipe. You're going to, you're going to sell pipe. Is that kind of the uh, thought process that got you into the business? I, uh, in middle school and high school, I used to get called out to the yard to put bumper rings on pipe. 
you know, when there was hot orders over the weekend. So we had bumper rings, you know, clean and redope threads. All right. So tell I, us if someone hasn't handled pipe, tell them what bumper rings are. Yeah. So essentially, uh, these are rings or, or it's either rope or plastic that goes around the pipe. Um, mm -hmm. and it's to prevent pipe from clanking against each other. Yeah. If you bang, bang it too hard against each other, it can create localized hard spots and impact the pipe performance. So these are like spacers, you know, they yep. it spaces between the pipe. Uh, it takes I've, about I've, 30 I've, to 50 pounds of pressure. As I say, I've personally oh. put on and removed tens of thousands of bumper rings. So just sitting there and like pulling them apart and then snapping them. Snapping it's them uh, it's some work, you know, it's, yeah. you, you do it 10 times. You're like, Hey, this isn't too bad. You put a thousand bumper rings on, you know, in a day stretch and yeah. you feel like you've been to the That's gym like for my, like, <laughs> five mm -hmm. hours. Do you know, anytime I burn out to, sets. Cause I ran expandable casing and anytime I get to a job, I'm like, all right, let's go fucking take off these, bu these bumper rings and take off our thread protectors. And it's like two hours of work, you know, just sitting there, just popping off rings. So yeah, it seems like a little task when you only do a little bit, but when you extrapolate it over an entire string of pipe, you it's tired. a lot of work. Yeah. There's a reason our, our guys in the field have probably the strongest forearms you know, yeah. <laughs> compared to anybody I know. <laughs> it's what um, everyone like in my jiu-jitsu gym always comment on my strength. I'm like, dude, I had that old man strength by the time I was 24 years old from yeah, <laughs> stuff <sure>. like that. <laughs> so I did. So in high school, I thought I'll never be in the pipe business. You know, that was my experience. Bumper rings, you know, work in pipe in the field. And, you know, I, I had bigger aspirations <laughs> than being in the pipe business. So out of college, I, I took the first job uh, well, the only job that I think I really had that was, was realistic. So I, I worked in Baku, Azerbaijan. Uh, I was there for about six months in the company I worked with. Uh, it was in the pipe business actually, but it was more subsea pipelines. And uh, was there for six months, got transferred to Dubai, spent two years in Dubai. And then 2008, into 2008, I started talking to my dad again. And, you know, I thought, you know, this may be something I'd like to do. And and really, I'd had some international experience under my belt. I, I had an interest in in kind of bringing some of what they were doing internationally. Mm -hmm. and, and still to this day, uh, you know, tap into those contacts and resources that I I had learned and, mm -hmm. and put together while overseas. So came back to CRA. Uh, this is two, into 2008. Uh, about 2013, kind of had the dream of pipe search. We just, we called it the trading platform. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody kind of looked at me like I was crazy. And <laughs> so a few years went by, uh, we had put it into a business plan. We'd started talking to some people out in the business to, or in the technology space to help us build it. And, uh, you know, we, I would say we spun our tires a little bit. We just, we didn't feel like we found the right fit in terms of groups or companies to help build it. We had no technology experience internally. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we were fish out of water in that. And so in 20. 18, I moved back to Dubai with my wife. Uh, we uh, set up a small office for CRA and I get, a, I get a message from a friend of mine that says, hey, somebody's trying to build that trading platform that you've always had a dream about. And so I looked at a press release and there was a pipe search uh, company that had launched and uh, I looked at it and thought, man, this is pretty cool. And uh, so I read about it, looked at it and uh, I saw the phone number. It's like, 10 o'clock, nine, 10 o'clock in Dubai, I'm actually sitting on the balcony, smoking a cigar, drinking a beer <laughs> and overlooking the sky Dubai and watching sky, you know, as this previously watching skydivers come down and just kind of hanging out. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna call this guy. And uh, Briggs Thompson was the guy's name. So I called him, we talked for about an hour. He had launched a marketplace, had no idea what, anything about the pipe industry. Um, he was he was chasing businesses. So he's a tech guy. And he, his, his thing was follow the industries that have the largest market cap, the most paper and the least amount of technology. And uh, somehow he landed on the pipe business and he nailed it in terms of, you know, an area <laughs> with, a, with, a, with a need. And so, uh, you know, we talked for six months, maybe nine months. And, and so anyway, CRA, uh, CRA then took uh, majority share ended up buying the majority share from Briggs. We kind of re um, reformed the company, and, and to this day, you know, we've got a, a group of technology guys that are through and through are software developers. They get technology, and they're based in Austin. Uh, and then we've got our kind of oil field expertise that's that's based in Houston. And so 
it's kind of a, it's a marri- marriage of dinosaurs and cutting edge technology. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, he's, he's one of the sharpest guys I've ever worked with. And just, I felt like it was a, you know, it was a blessing to get connected. It was really just total coincidence yeah, that that total happened. Luck, huh? How long has Pipe Search been around now? Or since, since that? When was that? So that was in, that was the end mm. of 2018. Okay. Um, you know, we're, we're technically still in, in beta. Um, yeah. Every, everything, every time we think we're, we're going to be fully live, we, we realize there's something else that we need. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that gives us flexibility not to push the product, uh, you know, out prematurely is that we have a proven offline business in CRA uh, that, yeah. that was already kind of trading prior to, you know, trading prior to pipe search. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's pretty funny that he was able to land on the idea of pipe search, you know, just kind of randomly with no, um, no prior exposure to it. But, you know, with you guys, how do you think, you know, like I look at like steel prices and pipe prices and, from my understanding, there's like a lot of um, just price discrepancy with pipe and, you know, there's just not like a solid marketplace or, you know, what's the going rate of nine and five eights casing. Um, how do you guys deal with that? You know, you talked about the bid ask spread being one of the hardest parts. I think that that's the hardest part of any marketplace where you're selling assets you guys have any kind of standardization of pricing? Are you able to take any data in on the back end? And we'll be like, hey, well, you know, this string of casing is trading for this price, you know, based off of a previous sell. How do you guys think about that and kind of being the benchmark for pipe pricing? So we, you know, at all points in time, we monitor prices around the world. We know, we know on a dollar per ton basis it's being sold for. We know... Uh, we know which mills are uh, over capacity, under capacity. Um, you know, we, we have we we keep pretty good handle on what's driving forces behind that. Whether it's uh, iron ore pricing, nickel alloy, you know, LME pricing from London Metal Exchange. So we take a very analytical approach to that. Um, you know, but a lot of what our pricing is driven by you know situations. So you know, we uh, I was telling Tim prior to this, he asked about, he asked a similar question about pricing. And, uh, you know, we, we have situations where the price of the pipe is very, you know, our cost to buy it. And if we were to sell it, you know, in the same spot, so say we, we buy it in uh, Brazil, um, we can buy it at, if we sold it to another operator in Brazil, we could be cost competitive. But the customer that came to us may need us to air freight it to uh, Canada or, or wherever it may be. So a lot of times the operational execution of the deal is a huge part of it. And so we look at the buyer, is the buyer, uh, you know, are they a value buyer? Are they trying to, are they trying to cut, you know, lower their AFE or lower their cost in the pipe? And we have, we have workflows and paths for that. Probably not going to air freight it in that case. They've got to have time for us to transport it from wherever it is. Um, but we also want to be the 911 phone call. And sometimes when you're in a rig down situation, they don't care, you know, they don't care what the price is. And, and I don't say that, you know, for arbitrage. I say that because, you know, I may know a customer that has that same spec that's actually allocated for a well. And they don't, it's not technically surplus, but mm-hmm. we keep an eye on it. We try to understand it. And if a situation comes up, you know, those customers sometimes will sell it, you know, if they can do full recovery value. Some they, sometimes they have to do, uh, full recovery plus cost to carry, you know, they have, they have different metrics internally. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we got, we got workflows for, for people who are looking for good deals. Um, and we have, we have paths for, for that 911 business. And yeah. what we found is that 911 business is really like, where do you differentiate yourself? You know, it's, it's really getting people out of a bind. Yeah. So, yeah. You're essentially being able to connect people all across the world when they're in a bind and help them when, you know, they may have not had a path forward we, we, prior to the platform. We used to, prior to the platform, we used to say, if you want to pull a rabbit out of a hat, call us. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, the reality was when they did call us, we were just like running around like we were on a fire station, everybody internally, like jumping on the phones, <laughs> calling places. Yeah. And we found a lot of success in that. And, and so we said, how do we automate this? How, do, how can we prevent provide a, a marketplace where the buyers can come and sellers, you know, can come to us. We've got a standardized workflow. Uh, 
with flexibility in it mm-hmm. built in because every situation seems to be different. Yeah. So, and that kind of comes back to this next question. Um, you're talking about, yeah, the flexibility because every situation is different. Do you help the clients when they're listing pipe? Do you help them come up with their, their pricing and things like that? Do you guys like actually, you know, consult them on that or is it kind of you're letting them list at whatever they want to list at? So the, the pipe stats report that we provide, it's a, it's a 20 year view of a, our history on that item or items that they're looking to sell. And it provides things like, uh, you know, what we're seeing in the market for that. It, it shows, um, what we call sales cycles, you know, Reality is, you know, these are, these are, no matter how much you discount pipe, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of buyers. You got to be, you got to want that pipe and you got to need that pipe. So an operator is not going to just go buy something because it's 25% of market price. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if they have a demand for it, they will. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the pipe stats report outlines what we think we can achieve in terms of pricing as a function of time. And this is, you know, so, so the operator has, looks at that and we talk with them and says, you know, if we buy it now, we always provide a buy it now. So if you want just cash now and you want to be away from it, here's our price. If you want us to market it for a year, this is what we think we can get. And then, you know, we talk with them to kind of understand their increments, but we have some products that are five-year sales cycles. And, you know, somebody brings it in, it's super, super custom. And uh, we, you know, a five-year sales cycle may we got to engineer it in well. We have a team of engineers. We have a metallurgist on staff. Uh, we have corrosion. You know, people are very knowledgeable about well environments and kind of modeling these type of things. So, you know, this is a heavily engineered sale. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so the pipe stats reflects what we're going to have to do on the sale side uh, to kind of gain the, re- the recovery value. And it, it is sometimes a come to Jesus moment, you know, uh, Everybody wants to sell it high and sell it fast. <laughs> um, but we use, we try to use data to, to yeah. really promote truth in that. And, yeah. you know, if you look at that over time, the data tends to be pretty accurate. We mm-hmm. do have outliers, but the data is a really good kind of checks and balances for reality. Yeah. What are some of the challenges that you guys have faced? Um, especially you're talking about merging of cultures between a typical, you know, pipe business and then cutting edge, you know, software startup team based out of Austin, you know, I'm sure there's challenges associated with that. Um, talk to us about that and anything else that you guys have, you know, really faced with the business. Well, uh, technology people typically want to do the same way, same thing every time, no ifs, ands, or buts. Yeah. Um, (laughs) oil and gas is like operates in gray. Well, this, if that, you know, there, there's always a changing landscape. And I think what we've learned at CRA is that, you know, not everything has to be, uh, you know, has to be gray. You Mm -hmm. know, there, there's, there's a lot more black and white in our business than we probably gave it credit for. Um, and I think what the, the group in Austin has learned is, you know, stuff that worked in the food industry or worked in the cattle industry or whatever it may be, isn't completely apples to apples with oil and gas. So, you know, we've had to build enough flexibility into the software where I'm sure it's painful for developers, um, Mm -hmm. you know, but we've also had to uh, take a hard look at our own business at CRA and say, okay, what's the truth behind the truth? Is there, is there something we can automate? Can we create an algorithm here? Um, You know, where, where do we need a personal touch and where don't we need a personal touch? Mm -hmm. I mean, oil and gas was always like service, 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 you know, 
get on the phone immediately. And that's yeah. how it was for years. I think there is a change in the landscape in terms of customer bases. There's people don't want to talk to you every time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, they do want an easy solution, but they do want to talk to you sometimes. So, mm -hmm. you know, you got to create software that allows that door to be open. Um, but if there is somebody who doesn't want to talk to somebody from start to finish, you know, we want software in place that can help them with that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point too. Um, you know, kind of changing dynamic of culture and generation, like younger generation doesn't want to talk to someone all the time. You know, they wouldn't go on the internet yeah. and just hit a, click a button and buy something. But also if you're talking about, you know, large purchases and assets and maybe they do need to talk to someone every once in a while. So being able to build out for that. Um, another thing too is you talked about, you guys kind of had to like reflect a little bit internally and say, Hey, are there things that can be automated? Can there be things that are black and white and not gray area? And I think it's, um, you know, I posted a video the other day of an offshore drilling rig and a lot of people that haven't been offshore, they don't know this, but like the drill floors are completely automated. Like you have a pipe arm that goes up the derrick and pulls a stand of pipe out of the derrick and it brings it down. And then the ST80 torques it up and you have automated slips. Like the roughnecks out offshore, like they're just fat because they don't do any work and they just eat all day. And you would have thought like 10, 15 years ago, like, oh, there's no way that you can automate roughnecking. Like, and in oil and gas, we've always had this kind of like mindset, like, oh, you can't automate that. You can't automate that. And I think people are starting to learn like, hey, a lot of things can be automated. And it's like, how can we automate, but also keep that, you know, human touch and ingenuity and creativity. Like you need that element as well. But I got a, f I got a f fun example, or at least I think it is a fun example of automation. Uh, so we, when I first started at CRA, uh, I got a was on the sales desk. Uh, we had a guy that, uh, there was somebody called in and looking for something and we didn't have it in our inventory. And so I asked the other guys, I said, where, how do I find this pipe? And they said, well, we got a Manila folder over there full of uh, notes that people have taken about surplus that they've known about out there. And so I literally went through it. There were sticky notes. There was people, things written on napkins. Um, <laughs> you know, somebody was at a lunch or a bar with somebody and wrote down something. And, you know, over time we found deals doing that. And so we fast forwarded a little bit. We ended up uh, pioneered our Excel database. Uh, yeah. Didn't know what normalization was at that time. So just put it in like one, one cell and like super long sentences. <laughs> so you couldn't actually find it <laughs> even though it was logged. So we normalized that, turned it into an access database, um, built a lot of pivot tables around that access database. And then now we've, we have a web app with pipe search. And so this was all around identification of surplus and things like that. Now, if somebody sends us, they can send us a picture, uh, they can send it Word, PDF, email. We can extract that. Um, we can normalize it, pull it into our system, and then it starts the whole process of matching that to likely candidates based on their, their typical well schematics, uh, nice. what regions of the world. So this was all, like I used to hand that off you know, there were tons of handoff points in that. And you really, you couldn't scale it because you had the logs, but it was really like, how was each person's brain storing and retaining this information? So, you know, we've taken it from not only being able to ingest that information, but start, uh, you know, start kickstarting action with it. And, you know, I, I think we'll get to a point where, you know, you can almost, I don't want to say automate the entire sales cycle, but you know, we can deliver a relevant message to somebody who actually is looking for that material real time. And, you know, there were five, 10 handoff points in that, you know, and then somebody's sick or out on vacation, you know, your whole process breaks down. It's broken. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if you're able to identify, you know, kind of in that database, you know, like you said, based on like, well, well profiles and like what they usually use, is it like the marketplace site, almost like a little bit proactive, like saying, Hey, we had something just come into inventory. We know that you guys use a lot of this. We just want to let you know before even that maybe that demand is actually put onto the platform. We so that's a that's a huge part of our future. And and we what we want to do is not just be, you know, hey, we have it, you know, FYI. Um, you know, we we even have it kind of narrowed down to geo markets, to basins, to well specific well types. And and so like let's take acid gas injection wells for for example 
be able to actually reach out, somebody files for a permit for an acid gas injection well. We may even have well data based on, um, you know, what kind of chemicals and things like that or fluids are going to be in those type of wells in that area. Now, you know, some of that's proprietary, some of it's stuff that we've we've gotten from kind of open uh, open uh, resources and things like that. Mm-hmm. So we'll deliver that message of availability, but also uh, connect a subject matter expert to the email chain and just say, hey, we see you're doing an AGI well. We've done, there's 10 active AGI well wells in your area. We've done seven of them and we did the alloy selection uh, well bore analysis on, on all of those. You know, if you're interested in, in discussion with us, you know, please contact us. And our, our response rate on that is just crazy high. You know, is it? it, you know, I think it's typical marketing, if you get like a 2% click rate, you know, yeah. you're doing well. Uh, when we were beta testing some of that, we had like 75% response rates. Wow. Jeez. Yeah. That's really high. That's nuts. Yeah. That's great. People are like, Hey, you did your homework. Like you have data that can help me. And we, we don't want to just be a product. This. We want to be a yeah. service too. Yeah. So that's really interesting when you talk about, you know, not only being the place for, um, you know, to find assets, but then you're also like playing matchmaker mm-hmm. too on the back end and matching up, you know, potential assets and operators and whoever it may be. So yeah, that's um, like, I love, I love your example of talking about the Manila folder with a bunch of like sticky notes and napkins. Cause like I love like old boring businesses because I hear that and I'm like, man, you could just have a simple CRM and make so much efficiency gains within a business just by deploying some basic technology. And then it's like, okay, well then once you actually have your database and then you can build a marketplace and then you can start building out um, automation and workflows that match both sides of the market. So what do you guys, you know, you said that you're in uh beta test or you know you're still beta testing different features right now if someone's listening and they want to try out the try out the platform they want to try out pipe search um just is pipe search on a standalone uh website or is it part of cra's website where can they find it so pipesearch.com it's its own website um pipe search is is the software how much did you have to pay for that domain i'm sure someone is squatting on that domain uh, you know, to be honest, you don't have to that was, answer. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, I was surprised it was available. Yeah, no, like um, people, like you think, like oh, no one will have pipesearch.com, but there's someone squatting on domains. Like, yeah, you can have it for 50 G's. <laughs> yeah, thankfully we didn't have to. We didn't have to pay 50 G's yeah. for it. Um, but yeah, sometimes the most obvious ones are the ones that are available. That are available. Uh, you know, so you, your, their interaction is they go to pipesearch, pipesearch.com. Um, pipesearch is going to stay a technology company. Mm-hmm. It actually technically doesn't do any of the buying and selling itself. Yeah. It, it manages the process and it's supported by what we're calling a system of facilitators. These are companies that have field operations, bricks and mortar, uh, technical services department. Um, and CRA is a facilitator within the pipe search platform. And so if you go to pipe search and you want a CRA product, CRA is going to be the person that's on the chat window. They're going to be the people that are behind the scenes uh, filling out quotes, um, pipe search is helping with the matching data aggregation, um, you know, kind of statistics and, and quite a few other things, you know, it's built the CRM, it's built the ERP yeah. uh, quality management system, all these things. The future vision is that, you know, they're going to be a, we're going to stack facilitators. So we're going to look right now. We're very narrow. We're CRA OCTG products. So Chrome's is what we're focusing on. Mm-hmm. Next progression, carbon OCTG, next progression, I don't know whether it's line pipe, uh, whether it's a schedule pipe, you know, but the idea is that we kind of take this workflow and have it in a way where we can extend it into other product segments within the pipe world and, and, and make it work. So beta wise, um, you know, it's fully live in terms of like, if you want to come and sell OCTG right now, we can do it and we can do it very well. The beta part is really about finishing out automation uh, from cradle to grave. So we w- we don't have the ability from start to finish to currently for somebody to to never talk to a person. Yeah. We just want to reserve. We want to be able to get there in the event somebody uh, wants to do that. I would say we're, you know, 70, 80% fully automated right now, mm-hmm. um, which is still pretty it's high, good. you know, especially for a business that was 100% not automated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at, I'm on pipe search right now. We got some... Two and seven eight seven point eight pound pipe 
20, 24,000 feet. So if you need 24,000 feet of uh, two and seven eighths, 7.8 pound, hit up pipesearch.com and just give you some, that was a good ad right there. I appreciate that. <laughs> become become the one to read ads for you guys. So no, man, this is uh, super cool. I geek out over marketplaces. And so to see one, um, you know, it, it's funny because it's like niche, but it's a huge market, right? And so I think that this is solving a pretty big pain point across the industry. So yeah, if you guys are listening, um, if you are a engineer that is planning a well and you're in a bind for a string of casing or tubing or whatever it may be, hit up pipesearch.com, see if you can find it. Just check it out. It's a nice platform. It looks nice. I appreciate that. So I'm just on my phone the too. The web version so, is good too. Yeah, I'm just on my phone. Um, so anyways, man, appreciate you coming on the show. Really interesting stuff. Yeah, thank you all for your time. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Yep. Absolutely. All right, guys, uh, if you haven't realized, we actually launched a new series called Wildcatter History. It's up on our YouTube. It's on the website. Dive into the stories of guys like T. Boone Pickens, Aubrey McClendon, uh, Sid Richardson, Glenn McCarthy. Uh, they're a lot of fun, 20 to 30 minutes long. Hope you guys enjoy them. Go check them out on the YouTube, and we'll catch you guys on the next episode.